Beyond Resilience is a series of curated conversations created by Firelight uh, with the purpose of exploring the challenges, strategies, and experiences of creating and distributing work during a time of crisis. Nobody's going to give us any power until we ask for it, until we demand it. The role of storytellers right now is to tell those stories that people are refusing to tell and to do so in a transparent manner. It is critical to me that my team, again, reflect the community that we are going to be talking about or the community that is the subject. There are so many missing narratives in the Black experience that would do so much to help both the understanding of Black people in our current situation, but also other people who are trying to understand what's going on. The decision makers need to change. Um, it is not okay that this small group of white folks are the ones who determine which stories matter, which filmmakers matter, and, and just decide and set the terms on which these stories are made. That is literally what has gotten us to the place that we are in. We're talking about systemic change, you know, not a one-time grant to to uh, to you know a couple of organizations. That that that's what we need. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Marcia Smith. I'm the president and co-founder of Firelight Media. I am a black woman with a medium afro, light tortoise glasses, and a lavender sweatshirt, and I'm welcome to all of you who are able to join us today. We typically start with a land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous presence and land rights. I am right now sitting in Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts on the land of the Wampanoag people. We all have a responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and the legacy of colonialism. I urge acknowledgements in the chat. Our chat moderator will drop a link to learn if you need to learn whose ancestral lands you live on right now. Um, I'd first like to thank the team at Firelight Media who put this event together, including Nicole Docta, Felicia Chanko, Scott Sledgester, and Justin Sherwood, and also the team at World Channel for partnering with us to host this event. Thank you also to the Open Society Foundations for their support of the Beyond Resilience series. The project is also supported in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York City Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you to the Firelighters, the generous group of individual donors who support provides vital funds for Firelight Media and our family of filmmakers. If you are interested in joining them, becoming a Firelighter, please use the link in the chat to make a tax deductible donation. Lastly, thank you to Karen Schmeider for her brilliant captioning services. To access the captioning on a desktop computer, click the CC button in the Zoom window and the captions will appear. If you are on a mobile device, click on more on the Zoom window or the three dots and find the captioning feature in the pop-up menu. Just to say a word about Firelight before we begin, Firelight Media is now almost 21 years old, is a premier destination for nonfiction cinema by and about communities of color. Firelight produces documentary films, supports emerging filmmakers of color, and cultivates audiences for their work. Firelight Media's programs include the Documentary Lab, an 18-month fellowship that supports emerging filmmakers, and the Groundwork Regional Lab, which supports filmmakers in the American South, Midwest, and U.S. territories, and the William Greaves Fund, which provides support for new projects by mid-career BIPOC filmmakers. Firelight also produces documentary short film series our latest film series, which we're very proud of, is called Hindsight. It is produced in partnership with Real South and the Center for Asian American Media with support from the World Channel. Hindsight explores the lived realities of BIPOC communities in the American South and Puerto Rico during the unprecedented events of 2020. All episodes of Hindsight are available to stream at firelightmedia.tv slash hindsight. 
As for today's program, I'd like to bring in our moderator. I'm going to try not to fangirl too much, Tambay Obenson, who will introduce today's film. Tambay founded the Shadow and Act outlet, which many of you I'm sure know, in 2009 building what would become the premier online destination for Black film and television coverage and criticism with a global perspective. He sold it to Blavity in 2017, and Tambe is currently on staff at IndieWire, where he's been a full-time writer since 2018. Tambe, thank you for uh, taking this on. Over to you. Thanks, Marcia, um, and thanks for not uh, fangirling too much, as, as you said. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you today for uh, this virtual screening of uh, Zach Manuel's This Body. Um, first, I'm a black man, I'm wearing a top hat, and uh, I have some a little facial scruff in an open space in my apartment without much of an interesting backdrop, as you can probably see. Well, those of you. Um, this body explores the fraught relationship uh, between African Americans and the medical industry. The film follows a young medical student and New Orleans resident, Sydney Hall, as she participates in an experimental coronavirus uh, vaccine trial in hopes of protecting her community. Throughout the trial, Sydney and her loved ones discuss the history of medical abuse and experimentation on Black bodies. The film is about uh, 13 minutes long. Following the screening, we will be joined by filmmaker Zach Manuel and panelists Dr. Thomas Leviste and Shana M. Griffin, who I'll introduce after the screening. So enjoy the film, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Okay, that, that was um, <clears throat> uh, Zach Manuel's um, This Body. Uh, we'll be bringing out the panel in just a second, uh, and we will uh, discuss uh, the main subject of the, uh, the documentary, which is this, uh, which I think everyone has heard, is this, this uh, persistent racial gap in who opts to get inoculated, uh, which studies, studies have said uh, presents a grave danger to communities of color specifically. Uh, right now, federal figures show that predominantly Black communities uh, have some of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. And so we're going to get a little bit into some of that uh, with the panel, uh, which includes uh, the filmmaker, Zach Manuel, uh, Dr. Leviste, and uh, Shana M. Griffin, who I will be introducing uh, in, uh, in a second. Um, Everybody's here. Okay, great. Um, okay, first, Zach Manuel uh, is an award-winning New Orleans uh, bread and based filmmaker and the son of a touring jazz musician and a community, lead, community builder at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. His film work explores intimacy, Black masculinity, class, identity, and, inherit and, and inheritance. His latest film is a documentary short we just watched, This Body, which um, is part of the Hindsight series from Firelight Media, Real South, and the, Saint, the, the Center for Asian American Media. Dr. Thomas Leviste's research and writing has focused on three broad, uh, broad thematic research questions. One, what are the social and behavioral factors that predict the timing of various health-related outcomes? Two, what are the social and behavioral factors that explain race differences in health outcomes? And three, what has the impact of social policy on the health and quality of American uh, life, uh, quality of life of African Americans? Uh, Laviste seeks to develop an orienting framework in the development of policy and interventions to address race disparities and health related outcomes. Shana M. Griffin is a Black feminist activist, independent researcher, applied sociologist, geographer, artist, mother, and abolitionist. She lives with, within the Black geographies of New Orleans and engages its feminist pedagogies, participating in research, organizing projects, and art practices that attend to the lived experiences of the Black diaspora. Shana currently lives as an interim 
uh, serves as the interim uh, executive director of Antenna, a multidisciplinary visual and literary arts organization, and is the founder of Punctuate, a recently established feminist research art and activist initiative foregrounding the embodied aesthetics and practices of Black feminist thought. Uh, thank you all for uh, for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And uh, thanks to, uh, to everyone who's watching uh, and who's tuning in. First, um, I believe everyone here lives in the New Orleans area or vicinity. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't first ask just, essentially, how's everybody doing? We're still in the pandemic, and then you get slammed with a hurricane, and there's a tropical storm now, leaving behind wreckage, power outages, and the like. So I'll just start with uh, Shana, ladies first. Uh, how are you? Um, how are you holding up? How's your family holding up? Friends, etc. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the beautiful um, introductions. And Zach, thank you for the opportunity to bring us all together to discuss the film This Body. Um, in terms of the disaster that has impacted the region, Southeast Louisiana, on the actual anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, um, I would say we're still in a similar place. And it's also in, con in times of disasters where we see the bodies of Black people um, disproportionately impact and harm. And also we see the ugly head of um, medical experimentations and science often can be used to pathologize communities, um, black communities and communities of color and poor people and blaming them for the problems that they are facing. Um, so, in, so there's that analysis and that's the reality on the ground. And also I'm fortunate that my house um, sustained uh, minimal damage and uh, most of my family members' homes are intact, but there was a few some roof and wind damage. Um, but in light of things and how other communities in the Bayou and River Parishes have been impacted, I am fortunate. Uh, Zach, how about you? Thanks, yeah, I appreciate the question and the concern. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to, I feel like I have to kind of reflect on what Shana said about this storm happening on the anniversary of Katrina. I feel like it brought up a lot of uh, similar feelings and kind of reflections of the past, almost mirrors of the past um, in the way that we were experiencing this storm. It was really, it was really interesting, difficult. Uh, you know, my family and I were fortunate enough that we did not sustain very much house, house damage, very minimal. Um, and we were fortunate that we had each other and we were able to, to spend a lot of time together. So that was, kind of a fortunate side effect of, you know, not having electricity for four or five days was just camping out together by the fan. So we were lucky. Dr. Luis? I'll say the same thing. I'm very, very fortunate and blessed that my, my home in New Orleans didn't sustain much damage at all. One tree fell, didn't land on anything. And no one was harmed. Um, but I evacuated to Baltimore, another city that I spent a lot of time in. I lived part-time in Baltimore, part-time in New Orleans. And so I got to experience it, not as a New Orleanian, but experience it the way the rest of the nation did by listening and watching on television while also talking to my friends and neighbors back in New Orleans and see the dichotomy between what was presented in the national news and what was actually happening, what people were feeling when I was telling me was happening. And I think a lot of that is racialized. You start hearing about looting and all of the, and when you talk to people in New Orleans, they're like, well, I don't know what they're talking about because I'm not seeing this happen. But the, the, the narrative in the media is very different. So I do think it's really I think, an illustration of how so many things in this country is racialized, even something like a storm. Yeah, um, uh, to tie it to the film, and I was gonna tie it to the film, obviously, um, uh, Kiera Coleman, one of the interviewees, she brought up she brought up Katrina, and I, I wanted to hear her talk a little bit more about that. Um, but um, I, I, I like that she brought that up, as well as the connection she made between the role of police officers and that of doctors, especially making the case that they're they're pretty much the same in terms of the power that they wield over the lives of human beings. So, do do each of you did you feel like you're getting a proper uh, you're getting proper support from local and federal government and maybe even more importantly sufficient medical care uh, for those who are sick and injured especially among uh, in, in the black community 
Uh, we'll start with Chena. Um, like you, I also appreciate the, cor the, um, the correlations that was being drawn between um, policing and also uh, policing and surveillance that occurs in the context of law enforcement and also the ways in which policing and surveillance takes place in the context of um, the medical industry. Uh, I was really struck by that and thought it was a powerful parallel um, to bring up. And in the context of your other question, I think it's really important um, just to take note that during times of disasters, um, disasters are very racial and gendered. Um, and most people, um, especially women, find themselves taking on more work um, women and queer folks, more work with less, res uh, more responsibilities and work with less resources. And in the context of that, our health and well being is often finding itself being at the back burner, constantly putting it off. And so you see these strong parallels when we think about disasters in the context of climate induced, um, you know, and human induced disasters also as it relates to pandemics, where we're focusing on one thing like the pandemic, for example, then there's these other health issues that many communities are experiencing and they're being put on a back burner. And now what we're seeing is the indirect death and causes of deaths directly tied to the pandemic, but not the result of the pandemic. And I've seen this and witnessed this also in the context of disasters, specifically disasters of 2005, um, where many people didn't die from the storm itself but they die from the aftermath in terms of neglect um, and also from preventative diseases um, that they had to wait. And because of the health, you know, healthcare system didn't come back online and it wasn't prioritized. Um, when we think about the healthcare system in the city um, and our social safety net that didn't come back online 10 years later. Um, and it's a safety net that many people throughout a five state, um, the Gulf region um, relied on as the number one trauma center and um, the Gulf region charity hospital not coming online and the vast majority of low income and black people relied on that healthcare institution. Um, and so it, it's, uh, you see these paradoxes uh, playing themselves out in these strong parallels. Zach, uh, in, in, in your research in uh, making this documentary, was this something that, that came up? Did you learn anything, anything new, anything specific about um, medical support uh, for uh, just general, whether it's related to the hurricane or just generally in the New Orleans area uh, with regards to um, um, people of African descent? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when I first started this project, I was approaching it from the lens of history and looking at how Black people and brown people also, but how Black people specifically and specifically Black people in the South would respond to a medical trial for this potential vaccine that presumably everyone would be affected by. Um, and so, you know, the, the first thought in my head was Tuskegee. Um, and I think that when I started to research and dig deeper into this project, it was actually something Thomas Levy said that, that kind of sparked a lot of the direction, but it wasn't so much these historical factors that were influencing people's decision to take a vaccine or not to take a vaccine, but it was the experiences that they had gone through or that their family members had gone through or that their friends or their neighbors had gone through that spoke to neglect or that spoke to malpractice uh, that really influenced their, their thoughts and their perceptions around the vaccine. And so I think it really kind of shifted my understanding of what the medical industry's power dynamic was when you're talking about Black people and the continuing issues that the medical industry uh, has as it approaches healthcare towards Black people. It wasn't a thing of history. It was something that actually was happening every day and will continue to happen unless it's acknowledged and you know, really kind of pulled apart and fixed on a, on a really micro level. Uh, very, very true. Um, uh, Dr. Lebeast, um, you were a consultant on the film, is that correct? Yeah, I guess you could say that. We, we, we talked a bit during the making of, of, of the project. I think the point, the point that I was making, Zach was just refer, re alluding to, was that I think we overburden the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And what it does, I think, is it has the potential of creating an, uh, uh, an inaccurate narrative that everything was going along just fine. In 1932, we did this one thing, and now they, they can't get over it. And that is not at all true, because about 15 years ago, I did a study here in Baltimore 
where we, we did a survey of the black community, of black and white people in the city, and asked about this Tuskegee syphilis study. And the majority of both black and white people have never even heard of it. So it's not that this is such that this is imprinted in the in the in the, in the, in the brains of African Americans. It isn't. But what African Americans do know is that untrustworthy behavior happens within healthcare systems today. And I think much more important than Tuskegee is your, the story about your neighbor that went to the hospital and was treated discourteously by the security guard. Your, your, your friend that went to the hospital and didn't get the treatment that they were supposed to get. Even in the film, we had the example of a woman who was, who was um, pregnant and didn't get the proper um, medical attention. Those are the real stories that I believe is just really driving the distrust. And, um, and I, don't think it, I don't think it serves us to pin this on Tuskegee rather than saying, no, there is contemporary stuff happening in healthcare settings that generates this distrust, which is very well deserved. I'm, I'm, gonna I'm sorry, I just wanted to just jump in really quickly because I would like to say sure. how we're bridging both the contemporary experiences of every day to the historical. Um, because I don't often think of Tuskegee, honestly. I often think of racial slavery and the medical experimentations that took place by Dr. Sims in terms of um, purchasing enslaved women and, um, and, and performing surgeries, experiments on their bodies. Um, and so this ongoing um, mistreatment, distrust, experimentation, whether we're talking about Henrietta Lacks and uh, what occurred without her permission and consent to sterilization in the context of reproductive violence, um, to even think about Tuskegee, but also, as has been stated um, uh, by, by Dr. Levine and Zach, is the everyday forms of violence um, in the context of medical experimentation, which is directly tied and rooted to these ideas about who is healthy and who is not healthy, who is deserving of care, who is not deserving of care, who has high tolerance um, for pain, and who do not. So, you know, when we look at the historical record, we see phrases like um, in experimentations on poor people, immigrants, quote unquote, people feeble minded, you know, people with disabilities. Um, and the same communities who was targeted for experimentation, or even I was just say eugenics, are also the same people today who are often targeted uh, for ongoing forms, ongo ongoing forms of discrimination um, and violence um, in their everyday lives, whether it's through policing, through housing, through medical experimentation. So the distrust is real. Um, and is rooted historically and most importantly, as was just stated, in the everyday realities. And to me, this is something that I thought I have thought a lot about it, um, have organized around a lot when I started the first women, I'm sorry, a feminist health clinic, not the first, established a feminist health clinic after Hurricanes Katrina in 2005. And you know, people will often ask me, you know, do you have a background, a medical background? And I was like, no, but I do have a new background and I know what it feels like to be mistreated. Um, and to be dismissed and using that experience, both as a sociologist and a researcher, but also as a patient. And I know what feels good and does not feel good and when I'm being disregarded and dismissed. And then there's the ideologies and the assumptions and the stereotypes that also are projected onto black bodies and other bodies of color that leads to that ongoing distrust that's directly tied to the historical. Yeah, we, we talk about Tuskegee, we refer to Tuskegee a lot. Uh, but it obviously goes, as, as Shana just said, goes much farther and much deeper than that from the era of slavery to the present day. Um, I don't wanna, I, I don't assume, but I'm just, I, I think I, I'll, I'll, I, maybe I should assume that everyone has read Harriet Washington's Medical Apartheid, which she published in 2000, or at least you've heard of it. Um, so when, when, when you start to unpack history, you begin to understand, uh, I guess I think so, the reasons behind widespread mistrust um, within our community uh, uh, of the uh, government and medical industry as a whole. Um, so I'll stick with you, Shana, uh, in your work with Black women very specifically. Um, how do you uh, approach conversations uh, with people who are hesitant uh, to get uh, vaccinated for COVID? Are there arguments that maybe are more convincing than others? Uh, um, yeah. That's the question. So I think it's really important that we have to um, engage this conversation in a very three-dimensional frame and not, you know, flat, one-sided. Um, it's really important that um, people have a right to ask questions, um, to express their concerns. Um, and I think it's irresponsible for many of us to say we have to trust the science because we know science have not always been kind to Black bodies. That's one thing. Two, we also have to 
acknowledge that we exist in a world where vaccines are not unfamiliar to us. If you have kids or if you've attended public schools, most of us have immunization records, um, have to get immunization shots. Or when we're traveling abroad, we get shots. And so somewhere along the line, the vaccinations have become politicized in ways that are killing people. I think it's really important that when you create a mandate, then you can create uncertainty and distrust in ways in which you may not have intended. And so I think it's really important that we don't put the focus on those who are not vaccinated versus those who are, so then we're creating a two-tier system um, or, or, or those who are, I mean, think about um, those who feel like they are able to move to the world and exercise their citizenship um, rights and then we have a second clear citizenship status by the unvaccinated. For me, in terms of the situation we're experiencing right now, it's not about the unvaccinated. To me, it's about human behavior and human activity. And I make these correlations between COVID and the climate crisis. We're in this climate crisis because of human activity. If we change our behaviors, we can turn a tide. The same is true as it relates to COVID. Uh, we know masks work. We know social distancing has been working. We know vaccines work, there is hesitancies, but it's not about saying, are you vaccinated or not? I'm not interested in policing, surveilling, or engaging any discrimination against someone because they're not vaccinated. I do, however, think it's really important that we push the issue push around the issue. changing human activity and behavior to turn the tide around COVID. Vaccination is one form of that. To me, it's important to acknowledge people's distrust, and it's also important to encourage people and to help move without attacking or blaming. As it relates to the Delta, to me, I put the responsibility on the CDC for their reckless and dangerous actions made in May, stating that people who are vaccinated don't have to wear masks, which opened the flood doors for many people to stop um, um, doing what we had been doing for almost a year, uh, a little over a year, in terms of modifying and changing our behavior and human activity. Um, and that's where the problem resides. And so to me, it's like, how do we encourage without necessarily blaming and also reinforcing different forms of discrimination. As a community, we know what discrimination looks like. We know what it feels like, and we know um, at least there's real material impacts, most of which in the context of death. Um, being Black should not be a pre-existing condition um, for a death sentence tied to COVID. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and we have to work through it and be able to meet people where they are sure. without blaming. Sure. Um, uh, I hope this is not too personal of a question, and Zach, you can answer first. Um, if it is, uh, feel free not to answer, and I'll, I'll move to the next person. Um, is everyone here is, is everyone here vaccinated fully? Yes, I am. Yes. I am also vaccinated, yes. Okay. But I think I also came to that decision through the make, I would say through the making of this project, because uh, I mean, initially, honestly, I had a lot of questions about the vaccine myself. And when I first thought about, you know, making this film and I thought about uh, just the dynamics of the medical industry against the black community, I really didn't know where I stood. And so making this film and talking to a lot of different people, uh, you know, we, we kind of had an expansive approach. We talked to tons of different people who had experienced different kinds of medical trauma. Um, and we also did a lot of research and we talked to professionals like Dr. Levice. And I think through that, I was able to come to a conclusion that felt right for me. Um, but, you know, and I, I think kind of to, to echo Shannon's point, it's, we've kind of gotten into this practice, I'm going off on a limb, but we're kind of gotten into this practice of, of shaming people. And we're kind of, you know, we have a binary forms of existence that we've been living in, but I think it's really important to listen. And I think black and brown people are, are not so used to being heard and to be listened to. And I think that's where a lot of uh, hesitancy and just standoffishness comes from because people's voices aren't being heard. People aren't taking the time to go to black communities and to hear their stories and to listen to them and to hear what they've experienced and then really kind of structure, you know, whatever kind of, medical education or medical treatment structured in a way that works specifically for them and for their community. And that's been kind of a huge national problem. Yeah, I, I, I have, um, I, have uh, I, um, I, I, I waited a little bit. I, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated as well, but I waited a little bit, um, I would admit. Um, not because of history, not because I was, um, uh, uh, 
I, not because of mistrust, it, it's because, um, because I bring this up because this is another angle that I don't think people really consider as well, which is that I'm hypertensive. I've had high blood pressure for about a decade. I take medication, I take multiple medications for it. Um, and my doctor, my, my doctor could not uh, say for sure whether or not, this was early on when the vaccines uh, 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 were released. Well, she couldn't tell me for, with certainty whether or not um, the shots would affect my my uh, interact with my medication or would affect my high blood pressure. She didn't, she wasn't really sure. So she told me to wait and so I waited um, and I eventually got it. Um, for Dr. Leviste, uh, if, if you can speak to uh, what, uh, what Shana and Zach did bring up um, in terms of this shaming, public shaming of uh, people who, who, who have maybe objections or maybe have other reasons or the, just the lack of maybe understanding of why they're why other than other than historical other than mistrust but there may be other reasons why uh, yeah. uh folks are not getting the vaccine yeah thank you for the opportunity to, re to respond let me let me respond by saying first that i am also like like shana I'm a, sociologist. I'm a medical sociologist and i'm also the co-chair of the governor's task force the Louisiana governor's task force on COVID 19 and health equity and I can say that from the very beginning, before we even had the vaccine, we were meeting and planning how we were going to distribute that, this vaccine and not create inequities. From the very beginning, day one, we were at the table talking about inequity and how we were going to make sure that this vaccine got into every community in the state, it's not just in the advantaged communities, the way that, which is what happened with before. Testing first went into the more advantaged communities. Black communities didn't get, didn't get any tests. And then it wasn't until we got that first data on deaths that we realized that African-Americans were also being impacted because we didn't have the data on testing. That was when they created the task force that I co-chair. So in that capacity though, I had opportunities to be in constant conversation with the chairs of other COVID-19 state task forces around the country and also at the national level to be a part of a lot of these conversations to hear what's happening. And I can say to you, without a doubt, that the issue of equity was on the table day one before the vaccine even had been finished being tested. We were always trying to figure out how do we do this right this time and not create inequities. We still wound up with the inequities, which I think tells you just how deeply ingrained um, racism is not within this country. And the fact that the geography of this country is that we are racially segregated as a country, it creates different levels of infrastructure within communities to be able to do things like deliver a vaccine or even conduct a test. The other thing I would say is that I, I don't blame, you know, I have to take somewhat disagree with Shana and her comment about CDC. CDC was learning about the vaccine and about this virus in real time, just like everybody else was, it was trying to make good decisions based on what was known. And the problem that would happen is that the scientific process doesn't usually take place in the media way it did with this. So people in the media know about everything that happened. So in, this, in the scientific community, it's regularly the case that somebody puts out a study and then we all say, oh, okay, we now know, we now know something from that study. And then another study comes out a month later and shows that no, what they said is not really right. There's another nuance to it. And then we all say, oh, okay, that's not exactly right. There's another nuance. If you're a scientist, you're trained to think that way. And you are trained to, to follow the science and understand that we're learning and you have to change your mind as new information comes along. But all of this information was put into the general public. And so the general public is looking at it as, well, CDC doesn't know what they're talking about because they said you don't have to wear masks anymore. Well, at the time they made that decision, it was the best knowledge they had at the moment. But new knowledge later came out that, uh, where we learned that um, transmissibility of the virus was not, was not sufficiently reduced just because you're vaccinated and that you still need to wear a mask when you're vaccinated. But when they did that, they didn't know that. I think this goes back to Operation Warp Speed, which comes out of the Trump administration. Because Operation Warp Speed, first of all, naming it Operation Warp Speed was a horrible decision because it focuses on the speed at which you're making the vaccine rather than the care that you're taking to do it right, right? So that's the first mistake. The second mistake was that it was all done in secret. 
It was, it was no transparency and only a privileged few, and I was among that privileged few, that got to meet with them and learn what they were doing and understand what was happening with Operation Red Food. They focused only on the vaccine development. They didn't focus on the human element at all. So there was no strategy for how are we going to communicate to people? How are we going to trust this vaccine? How are we going to get people to opt into accepting it? It was only on creating the vaccine, the idea that creating that vaccine was going to solve the problem. But the social science is just as important as the biological science. And they only focus on the biological. That is where the real issue comes in, because all this distrust that comes out, because this, this narrative, this hastily prepared vaccine that hasn't been around very long, we don't know, we know what the impact is. Even your physician telling you to not put the vaccine hypertension, what we knew was that having hypertension puts you at greater risk if you got infected with that virus. And I think that the more responsible thing would have been to say, well, given your higher risk status as a hypertensive, you need to get vaccine more, it's more urgent for you to get vaccine than other people, right? Mm -hmm. There was no one really focusing on the, the social science aspect of it, only on the, on the, the virology or the, the, the vaccineology. And that's what I think was the real error that was made here, along with the fact that the Trump administration politicized a virus like a virus cares by your political views. It politicized it, and then we had people who are now saying with a straight face that people should have the option to opt into a virus, to vaccine or not. Well, we know that the way this works is that if we don't have a large enough percentage of people that gets vaccinated, we are not going to ever get past the pandemic. And it shouldn't be just a, a, a matter of individual choice. Okay. I don't know. Okay, I was going to actually going to ask you to respond if you wanted to. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with a lot that you're saying. And I do think the key word here is responsibility. And I think the CDC was irresponsible in its actions. I recognize what you're saying. I think the emphasis on speed, especially under the Trump administration, um, was a death sentence for many people because it also created a lot of distrust um, where there were, I was on the fence and I'm fully vaccinated. I also think given that everything that was happening, and as you mentioned, it's unfolding in real time in a public fear for the CDT, CDC to make a strong declaration like that. That was like that. And I think the CDC should have to take some responsibility from that. Is it only the CDC? No, I don't think it is. But I do think that there, the CDC should have some responsibility to bear um, because people die. And I also think that, you know, uh, what we're experiencing right now, as you mentioned, it's not politicized, yet it is. I think that people like Robert Kennedy and Israel put out a film called Pandemic, a very polished, well produ produced film that basically states trust and fear. I think people like that should be should be blamed because they are basically creating information that's leading to people's deaths, causing people to not get vaccinated. And I think that more deaths have occurred because of that, and the Trump administration and other Republican politicians and radio talk shows. I think many more people have died because of their actions than the CDC. Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. absolutely. I agree hundred percent. I do think that there's a lot, it's dangerous when, um, you know, uh, you know, it's a very dangerous situation that we're finding ourselves in because people are making decisions out of fear. And some yeah. of that fear is real and a lot of it is perceived and created. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's hard. And then, you know, there's also so many people who have died not because of COVID, um, but because they have delayed going to the hospital. They have the, or they can't because of, you know, the number of ICU um, units that are full, right? And that's a tragedy in and of itself. Um, let me bring, uh, bring Zach in here uh, and then kind of uh, switch, switch up a little bit. Um, I, I will admit that I'm ignorant to how the process of these trials work. So, uh, you're the filmmaker, you've, you've, I'm sure you've, did the, you've done the research, I'm sure, Shina, and that. Uh, uh, Dr. Levisno as well, um, but it just enlightened me, enlightened uh, also who, people who are watching. Why would anyone, regardless of race, gender, class, why would anyone volunteer um, to essentially be a, a guinea pig? I think that's a great question. I mean, I think everybody does it for a different reason. Um, I mean, I can speak for Sydney because she's um, one of the few 
people that I was able to speak to who was actually going through the trial, for her, it was the personal reason of wanting to continue to have a close relationship with her family, her grandmother, her mother, who she wasn't able to see. Um, I think also what I learned about the process of medical trials is that they, you know, Sydney wasn't the first person to go through a trial. It doesn't just kind of open up to a vast group of people initially. It goes through different phases of implementation. Uh, I think they start with, it might be a thousand people or something like that. I'm not exactly sure how those people are chosen, but they're tested. If they don't have any adverse reactions, then the trial moves to a bigger group of people, a more expansive group, a more diverse group of people, and so on and so forth until it gets to more or less the public uh, trial, which is what we saw, which is like, I guess, back in maybe October or September, where they were calling for people to participate in the trial. Um, that's as far as I know. I'm not a medical professional, but uh, just uh, just the filmmaker providing space for people to tell their stories. But, um, you know, I mean, I think it's a, it's a position to be a trial participant that you come through, come to rather, through an enormous amount of trust or maybe hope. Maybe hope is the right answer. I think the hope that things will get better, the hope that people will not get sick or that the numbers of people who will get sick will go down. And, um, and I think it's weighing a lot of factors about your personal health and your, your, your life, uh, the way you live your life, your contact with people, your contact with relatives, loved ones, immunocompromised people that all go into, am I gonna have this test conducted on myself? Any, any plans to, is this part of a larger project, um, maybe a series of docs or maybe even a feature that you might want to expand this to, or like what, what's, what's going to happen next? I mean, I think it's a part of, um, not, not a series, but when the pandemic started, my partner and I, you know, like everyone else, we were just kind of watching the news incessantly and, and like doom scrolling on Instagram, but there was a lot of talk about how black people and people of color were disproportionately affected. And so we kind of, we kept looking at this word disproportionate, disproportionality, and we wanted to kind of open that up and really explore what disproportionality means. So, you know, is it lack of access to healthcare? Is it work condition? Is it lack of finances? Is it lack of, you know, quality food? Are you living in a food desert? Um, for many people, it's kind of a, it's kind of a litany of a lot of different things. And I think, you know, we, we explored that through, we looked at the transportation system in New Orleans and we were riding buses and we were asking people to tell their stories about, um, you know, how they were impacted by COVID-19 and the stories of the operators, specifically Valerie Jefferson, who's an activist, really powerful person um, who was just unjustly fired from her role as the ATU president, which I think everyone should kind of read into. Um, and so when, I, when, when the trial started coming out, I was looking at disproportionality from, from the angle of psychological and experiential, and uh, what are the differences in people of color? People of color's experience, Black people's psychological experiences that really kind of affected their, their decision to uh, you know, to do this or not, or just their, their thoughts about, about COVID-19 or how they were dealing with it, how they were grappling with it. So not part of a series, but um, it's, it's one of, I think, four films that we made uh, that kind of explore disproportionality through a lot of different uh, lenses, but all through Black experience. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're running out of time. So I'll ask one final question and then I'll look for, uh, I guess we'll spend a few minutes to see if any, any, uh, any one of the audience has questions. Uh, last question, so that there's the ongoing heated conversation obviously is about choice. Um, but at the same time, you have Biden, President Biden and local governments across the country lean towards mandates. Uh, you have restaurants, uh, shopping locations, gym, even the workplaces that are making vaccinations a requirement. Um, thoughts on that? I mean, is there any reasonable, I mean, we've, we've already kind of talked about that a little bit, but but history aside, mistrust aside, if, if, if that's possible, 
Um, any reason, any reasonable reason today for anyone at this point to still reject uh, the vaccine, other than what we've already talked about, given the percentage of people who have taken the vaccine and are still standing, versus those who, are, who had a fatal side effect like myocarditis or pericarditis, which I think was primarily in, the, in the young young men. Um, we can work uh, work backwards and start with that. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because I think that the vaccine has proven to be somewhat effective against the virus, especially if you're talking about groups of vaccinated people. Uh, transmission rates obviously are extremely low. But I think philosophically, you can't mandate a, I mean, you really can't mandate anything to black and brown people. It's just not the way that, I mean, that's, that's a complete, unacknowledgement of the history of treatment against black and brown bodies. And I think, you know, you have to acknowledge the mistreatment, you have to acknowledge the history, you have to acknowledge the continuum of mistreatment that extends to police, it extends to doctors, it extends to government, local, state, national, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about something that someone should do or a group of people, something that they should do. Uh, so I think when you're talking about mandates, I think it's, it's a little bit of um, kind of missing the point of people's personal experience. And until you meet them there, I think there's always going to be pushback. Uh, Dr. Levist? So oh, I, I, um, I was in graduate school working on a PhD in political sociology when I discovered there was this thing called racial disparities in health and totally pivoted my entire trajectory and went into public health because there were black and brown people dying in the streets unnecessarily. And so from that perspective, I believe that it is necessary that we mandate the vaccine and that we mandate it as soon as we possibly can. We have in just the United States alone, almost almost 700,000 people have died from this virus. How many people have died from the vaccine? Worldwide, over 4 million deaths from this virus. Worldwide, we've got tens of millions of people who have been vaccinated and we do not see side effects, deaths and other adverse outcomes from that vaccine that would warrant any additional continuing mistrust or concern that the vaccine is harmful. While on the other hand, we know that this virus is deadly and it's killed a lot of people. I doubt that there are many people in this country that don't know at least one person who has died from this virus. I think mandates are absolutely necessary. Controversial position there, doctor. <laughs> I've written about it, I've said it in the media many times and I even yep. uh, <laughs> read that advice to the governor. I think that we need to we need to mandate the same way that we mandate the vaccine for polio and chickenpox and measles and rubella and I can go down the list. They're all vaccines. We mandate those vaccines. People don't die from the vaccines, and people don't die in this country from cholera anymore. Hard to argue with that, but I'm sure uh, uh, Shana will. Go ahead, Shana. You have the last word. Oh, oh, thank you. The last word. I appreciate um, I, I appreciate the sentiment that actually Zach started us off with in terms of how we how, building trust and can you build trust through a mandate? And also with Dr. Levine, just thinking deeply about what you're saying, and I appreciate the parallel in terms of the number of people who have died from the virus versus those um, that have died from the vaccine. And also the reality is that, you know, most of us have had immunization shots and those shots saves lives. Um, and so for me, I think it's really important that we have to, there has to be a, another angle, how we can come in um, and not mandate, because mandate is going to allow make people shut down. It's almost like if you call someone out, they're no longer listening. They just want to fight, right? And I think there has to be another way in which how we engage and reframe vaccination as a form of, pre of prevention, the same way we have historically reframe immunization shots as a way to prevent unnecessary death and harm. Because, you know, we don't just belong to ourselves. When an individual dies, it has an impact on a broader community. Um, you know, their jobs, their loved ones, um, family members, 
friends, you know? And so I think we don't just belong to ourselves, we belong to each other. Um, I have asthma and I told my daughter, I was like, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't wanna die right now. And I can imagine, um, you know, when I think about what life would be like for my daughter and my son, if I wasn't present in this moment. And so to me, that was the motivator. There was distrust. I did feel like this is happening so fast. I can't even wrap my head around it. And I also recognize there are many people who are not vaccinated, who are not part of that group, that community of, um, um, you know, the uh, anti-vaxxers, right? And I feel like everybody get lumps together and that becomes unfair. So I do think that we can carve out a pathway to make it possible we can increase the number of people who are vaccinated. But by the framework of mandates, we shut it down. And maybe it could be semantics, but I feel like we have to create another parallel, another pathway that can allow us. And whether we were not discriminating against folks, because I think that's the danger right there. And I do believe, you know, I know people who want to sit in restaurants and they don't, they're not vaccinated. And I'm just like, okay, you got some tough decisions to make. You can't sit your ass in a restaurant and then not be vaccinated. If you want to sit down for an hour or two, then you have some difficult decisions to make because it's not fair. So that's where I'm at. Should people get vaccinated? I think they should. And I also think we should hear people and understand the reasons why. And we just have to reframe it. And that's that's the challenge right now. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add one thing, Sambe. Um, I'm really quickly. happy to have, say that again. I said, I said quickly. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I was just going to say I'm really happy to have both Shana and, and uh, Dr. Leviste in conversation together. One of the big things that I hope people take away from the film that I think happened today is that you can have two different opinions in conversation in the same room, and we can all kind of learn things from each other and glean insight from each other. So I really appreciate, appreciated that from both Sydney and Kiera, who are good friends, but also come from very different experiences. And I appreciate that from everyone today also. Yeah, balance balance is key, and you have to hear, hear all sides. Um, I, would, I thought we'd have uh, time for questions from uh, from the audience, but it looks like we do not. Uh, so I just want to, be, uh, before we get cut off here, uh, thanks again to our panelists, um, Dr. Levis, uh, Zach Manuel, and Shana. Um, Zach, especially for this lovely and timely film, um, and I hope that you continue your investigations uh, into this very sort of a controversial, uh, divisive subject. Um, all films in the Hindsight documentary series are now available to stream via the Firelight Media website on World Channels, World World Channels YouTube channel, and on Real South and on the PBS app. For more information about the series, visit Firelight Media tv forward slash hindsight firelight media tv forward slash hindsight uh, that should be in the uh, in the chat notes uh, thanks everyone for joining us and um, we hope to see you at the next beyond resilience event and uh, thank you for having me uh, moderate this not this uh, this uh, conversation I uh, wish we could go on longer but uh, we can so but thank you have a good day everybody